that means a lot. Matthew chapter 5, uh, we're going through the, uh, the Beatitudes, a part of the Sermon on the Mount, or the introductory of these several chapters that, are Jesus, that Jesus our Savior uh, preaches. But let's look at verse number 5. Verse number 5, as we continue on this, the uh, Bible says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek. Thank you, Father, for the Word of God. And uh, thank you, Lord, for the truths that we'll learn tonight. I pray you'd bring our hearts and minds uh, to a place of receptiveness, Lord, to your Word. And that, uh, Lord, that we truly would grasp the importance of this very, very important Christ-like quality. We cannot produce these in our own strength. We must depend solely upon you. And so, Lord, I pray you'd reveal some areas of our life that maybe we're not um, showing forth uh, this thing of meekness. And then, Lord, that you would uh, help us to grow. Uh, please, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. You can be seated. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meekness matters to God. It doesn't matter to the people of this world and this culture, but it does matter to God. Uh, you don't have to turn there, but in Zephaniah chapter 2 and verse 3, Zephaniah chapter 2 verse 3 says, Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth. And uh, you know, the true heart that seeks God is going to be someone who truly has a meek heart. Uh, if we're not meek, then there's no desire for us to know God and to grow in our relationship with God or even a desire to follow on like our theme is uh, for this year. Colossians chapter 3 verse 12 says that we're to put on meekness. And so as you get up in the morning and you put your garments on, put your clothes on and get ready for the day, there's some things that God also, spiritual garments that God wants you to put on. And one of those garments, he says, I want you to put on meekness. And so meekness is important to God. God says, I want you to put on meekness. First Timothy chapter number six and verse 11 tells us that we're to follow after meekness. And so meekness is to be a leader that we follow. It's supposed to be an example that we emulate in our lives. And God said, I want you to follow after meekness. It's not just for some believers. It's for all believers. It's not something that's just for a unique few of us. It's for all of us. God wants all of his children to, uh, to thrive in this thing called meekness. Now, there's a lot of confusion about meekness. We've been going through uh, the fruit of the Spirit on, uh, during our Sunday school hour, we're on the, the, uh, the last characteristic of that fruit of the Spirit. And uh, one of the fruits that we covered was meekness. And we're going to go, some of that a little bit will overlap a little bit, but I wanted on purpose, I knew I was going to be preaching this series of messages in relation as well as the Sunday school lesson. So the things that we'll cover tonight, if you're in Sunday school, uh, will be a little bit different than what we've covered in Sunday school about meekness, just because of the placeness of where this verse is, where it says, blessed are the meek, and it's God's uh, recipe or God's formula of how to find happiness or how to enjoy uh, happiness in our lives. And so uh, it's not just for some of us, it's for all of us. Now, meekness is not highly valued in the world, and here's why. They don't understand what meekness is. They have a, 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 a misinterpretation of what meekness is. To the world, meekness is weakness, and so that rhyme that goes with this, and so anyone that is meek uh, is someone that's weak. It's someone that uh, gets taken advantage of. And, and as we'll see here in a moment, I'll give you some of those examples. The world does not esteem meekness. Rather, they do the opposite of that, uh, which is self-assertive, stand up for your rights, be demanding, speak your mind, have it your way. And uh, God highly values that which the world despises. And so whatever the world doesn't like, it's probably something that ought to be implemented or added to our life. If it's something the world despises, then that's probably a good advertisement to say, wow, there, I don't know all the details here, but it must be good because the world is sure fighting pretty hard. The culture of our, our, you know, our culture is fighting pretty hard about that. The world looks at a meek person and says they're weak. God looks at a meek person and says they remind me of Jesus. And I don't know about you, but there's nothing that ought to encourage and motivate us more than to say, I want others to look at our lives and our home and our family and say, you know what, they remind me. It's countercultural uh, to what the world's going, but I want them to look at me and say, that reminds me of Jesus. And so it's, it's, it's important uh, if meekness is important to God. And he says, put it on, follow after, uh, then it ought to be important to us. But it's not just about being important to us, it's also about understanding what meekness is. And uh, so tonight, here, here's what I'd like you to do in, in the quietness of your heart this evening. I want you to ask God, uh, as the message is taught, as the message is, is preached tonight, this has been a message that's been really 
hard to, to put in an outline form. It, it, I've tried really hard this last week to really put in a form that just sort of flows nicely. And sometimes those just fall right into place and it's just sort of you get your alliterated points and things just fall right into place. Other times uh, it's a little bit more shotgun. They're just all out there. Uh, they all inter interrelate to each other, but there's not that outline that goes. And this was one of those uh, type messages. So tonight uh, I want you to ask God to give you give the Spirit of God freedom in your life, in your heart, to reveal those areas in our lives, in your life, that, uh, the, that uh, meekness may be a weakness in your life. Not that it is weakness by definition, but maybe it is a weakness in your life. It's not something that's uh, growing in your life. And I want you to ask the, the Holy Spirit to place within our hearts as well a desire of repentance, a spirit of repentance, so that when God reveals that meek weakness in our life, meekness, weakness in our life, that, uh, that we'll have a spirit that would say, God, I am so sorry. I never knew that that weakness in my life was tied to a lack of meekness in my life. I never put those two together. And so, Spirit of God, I want you to reveal to me as the word is spoken tonight and, uh, and that you would bring me to a heart of repentance so that my heart would be changed because if my heart's changed, my life will be changed. And by the way, that should be the way we enter any type of uh, Bible preparation, any type of Bible service, is God, would you change me? Would you use this truth to make a difference in my life? Would you give me a heart that's uh, ready to submit and yield and repent if needs be uh, in some areas? And then ask the Holy Spirit tonight to produce that fruit of the Spirit in your life, meekness. Now, fruit of the Spirit, as we've learned in Sunday school, it's not plural. It's not the fruits of the Spirit. Love is a fruit and joy is a fruit. It's fruit singular of those nine characteristics that make up the fruit of the Spirit. And so all of them proportionally will grow together. You can't just isolate and say, well, I'm going to focus on love and, and not worry about everything else. They all grow, and the, and the verse tells us there in Galatians, uh, the fruit of the Spirit, the several next couple of verses after uh, Galatians there, 5, it tells us if we walk in the Spirit and if we live in the Spirit, the byproduct will be the fruit of the Spirit growing in our lives. And so I can't make the fruit of the Spirit grow, but I can walk in the Spirit. I can live, make that a part of our lifestyle. We walk and live with God uh, in the Spirit. And then the byproduct will be the fruit of the Spirit. And so ask the Spirit of God tonight uh, to, uh, to produce uh, that uh, fruit in your life, that characteristic of that fruit uh, of meekness in your life. And then ask God to make us tonight a meek man of God, and ask God to make us tonight a meek woman of God, and uh, that God would really, because if meekness is so important, then I want to know what it is and how to implement my life. It'll, 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 it'll make a difference in your marriage. Uh, it'll make a difference in your home, your family, your parenting. It'll make a difference in your walk with God. Of course, it's, we're not covering the walk with God tonight like we do on Wednesday night, but they all interrelate inter inter a little bit. It'll help your ministry, your interaction with people so much. And so I want you to ask God to, for that uh, tonight. So let's just take a few moments and uh, ask God to do something in our hearts tonight. Thank you, Father, for the truth that we're about to hear. And uh, Lord, uh, most of us don't really have an understanding of what meekness is. Uh, when we think of the word, a lot of negative uh, things cross our mind about weakness and someone that doesn't have uh, 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 courage and someone that's uh, a little bit um, uh, uh, flaky and wishy-washy. And, and so, Lord, help us. Reveal the area of weakness tonight uh, concerning meekness in our life. Not that meekness is weakness, but, Lord, meekness is weak in a lot of areas of our life. And so reveal it. And the Holy Spirit of God convict us, help us, and grow uh, this uh, very important Christ-like quality in our lives tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't think tonight I'll get through this topic because there's so much that uh, is here. But uh, the Beatitudes are uh, paradoxical, as we've already established, meaning they're uh, counterproductive, what we think they should mean. So, for example, uh, it's more blessed to give than to receive. That's, that's, counter, that's a paradox. That doesn't make sense. Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. The Bible, the, the world says, blessed are the wealthy, blessed are the materialistic, blessed are the rich. And so God says, blessed are the poor in spirit. And uh, blessed are those that mourn. Uh, we saw last week. And uh, God, the world says, blessed are those that are party and happy and you know, top of the, you know, all those kind of things there. And so there's and the same thing here with regards to meekness. And so uh, as we look at this word meekness, uh, meekness off the top is not, as I've already said, is not weakness. 
Uh, it's not um, uh, wishy-washy. It's not indecisive. It's not to be timid. It's not to be unsure of yourself. Meekness does not have, um, uh, mean having no opinion or being a weak, fragile, wimpy, brainless, pitiful individual. Uh, if you were to ask somebody in the world what they think meekness is, that's probably how they define it. Someone that's real, you know, uh, uh, no backbone and wishy-washy and, and real weak and people walk over them and use them as a doormat. And, and that's how the world defines it. So we, our tendency is what? I don't want to have anything to do with meekness because that's a sign of weakness. And, uh, but as we study the Word of God, we realize it's really a great uh, strength. And, of course, uh, a summary of a, of a definition we give is uh, uh, meekness is, uh, is a strength under control. It's power under control. And we'll see how that comes together. Meekness uh, is not cowardice. It's not spinelessness. It's not a willingness to have peace at any price, at any cost. It's not a lack of confidence. It's not shyness. It's not the opposite of extrovertedness. Meekness is not a lack of convic conviction. It doesn't mean that we must cower or retreat for what we believe and does not involve the surrender of our life. Meekness does not necessarily equal, ju uh, equal just having a shy or quiet personality. Uh, you can be a very quiet person but not be meek. Uh, you know, sort of that uh, explosive anger that, uh, that you never maybe see the outburst and the rage on the outside, but uh, just because you're quiet and, and uh, give the appearance of, of being very shy and introverted, that doesn't mean that that necessarily is a quality of, of a meek spirit. Uh, there can be that underlying streak of stubbornness and pride and control issues and resentment in your heart and that simmering anger uh, of a resistant spirit. Uh, it's almost like uh, I'm standing up on the outside because Dad said stand up, but I'm sitting down on the inside. You know, we've all been there at times where uh, on the outside we conform, we submit, but on the inside, boy, we're, we're sitting down, we're holding our ground. And, and so as we look at this thing of, of meekness, um, uh, meekness uh, is used of three different types of people to help us to understand it. It was used of doctors, it's used of sailors, and it's used of farmers. For a doctor, they use the word meek to describe the soothing medicine that would take away the pain. And so they would then uh, administer as a doctor that which would be meek, and, and it would be the right medication, the right prescription that would then uh, desensitize or take away the pain. Uh, a sailor would use the word meek of a lovely, cool breeze that brings freshness and refreshes the sailors, you know, out in the sea of the humid time or whatever it might be. And then a farmer would use the word meek of an animal that is broken and is able to be used and useful on the farm. And so uh, all of those things sort of coordinate together about what a meek person is. And so as we look at this thought of, of poor in spirit and uh, look at the thought of as uh, blessed are they that mourn, each of these are, are like a chain that are building upon each other. They're not just randomly. God puts things in order. He does everything by divine plan and divine order. And so the first thing is poor in spirit. What's that? That's seeing myself intellectually, seeing myself as a sinner having nothing to offer God. And we took a whole message in talking about that. So we won't belabor that, but that's what the poor in spirit is. It's recognizing, boy, I am wicked, I am vile, I am sinful. I have nothing to bring to the table for God. And once intellectually I begin to understand that and begin to comprehend that, then we come to the next one where the Bible says, blessed are uh, those that mourn, or they that mourn. And uh, that's now where the intellectual goes from the head 16 inches or 12 or 16 inches or so to the heart and that we begin to feel remorse for the sinfulness of our lives. We begin to feel remorse for uh, the, the wrongs that we've done and we begin to realize how much we've grieved God. And we talked about that last week about uh, the blessed are days that mourn because we really begin to understand, poor in spirit, how wrong I've done and then we begin to really feel the hurt and the damage that that wrong has done and that's where we begin to mourn. And then we come to this next, and all of these build upon the other. And then we come to this, this last one where the Bible says, Blessed are the meekness here, or those that are meek. And so this person uh, is one who truly is meek, is a one who's amazed that God would be so good to him in spite of how 
undeserving of God's goodness he is. Because they build. Why? I'm poor in spirit. Intellectually, I know that I have nothing to offer God. I am sinful. I am a sinner. And not just a sinner gen generally, but you begin, God, the Holy Spirit begins to reveal spin, sin specifically in your life. And when you begin to intellectually recognize that, that then transitions to your heart and you begin to feel uh, and recognize emotionally, uh, you begin to mourn in sadness of the hurt that your sin has caused the Savior, the hurt that your sin has caused others, and then you come now to the next step, uh, which is uh, meekness, and meekness then uh, is a person that, uh, that uh, is amazed that God can think of him as well as he does and treat him as good as he, as he actually does, and uh, that's humbling. Uh, you, if you've got, say, well, I've got my rights. I don't know why God doesn't answer my prayer. And I don't understand why God didn't do this for me and God does it for everybody else. You've missed, the, you've, you've, you've missed the first two points because if you realize you've got, you're nothing, you're sinful, and that grieves your heart of the hurt that you've caused God and others and uh, the cause of Christ, then that brings you to the place of meekness where you now, in a very meek spirit, begin to, to amaze, you're amazed at how gracious God is to you in spite of knowing this and feeling this. It's amazing to you how blessed you are of God in knowing how wicked you are and feeling and hurting and grieving of all that wickedness. And it amazes you why God would be so kind to your life. It's like the verse where it says the goodness of God brings us or leads us to repentance. And uh, God, that's, that's where the goodness of God just humbles you. It's not, well, about time God did something in my life. You're not meek in, in that, that mindset. Uh, if you're demanding and judgmental and waiting for God, well, where's my due justice and where's my answer to prayer? Where's my blessings and where's my this? Then you need to go back to square number one. You got to see you're sinful, you're wicked. You're, you need to recognize the poorness of spirit. And then that will produce, after you're intellectually aware of that, a mourning in your heart, an emotional feeling response uh, that will then bring to an attitude of meekness uh, in your heart. And so meekness is that response you have. So, our, so if you have a meek spirit, uh, our treatment of others is rooted in how we view them in response to how we view ourselves. And so I will never treat others the way uh, God would have for me to treat them until I see myself the way I really am. But I'm not going to see myself the way I really am until I, poor in spirit, intellectually I begin to see the Spirit of God reveals it to me. I then feel burdened and broken and hurt and sad because of how ungodly that I am and all the, th the hurt that I've caused. And that brings me to the next step of meekness. I now am, am humbled. I now am amazed. I'm now in awe of how good God is to me, knowing uh, this about me intellectually, feeling this way because of my sin, and why God would do so much. And so now I'm transitioned into this area of meekness. Now there's three different qualities that are very closely related uh, that can often be inter interrelated and confused. They're different because in Scripture you'll see these words used uh, together in the same verse. So you know that they're not exactly the same, uh, though they may be very, very similar, uh, because they'll use uh, this word, uh, meekness, and uh, one of these other words that we'll look at, and uh, they're using the same verse. They're not just saying this is what meekness means, but these are complementary uh, assets or, or, or things that are there that God... So there's three words I want to give you that, uh, that are often very closely related uh, to about this thing of uh, meekness. Number one is the word humility. Humility, and these are the three points we did cover these in Sunday school, but they're, they're very foundational, and I want to, for the sake of those that are in Sunday school, just uh, bear with me just for a moment. Uh, there's three qualities that are interrelated that deal with meekness. Number one is humility. Humility is uh, how I view, it, it's how I, it's what I do in relation to my view of myself. Uh, if I esteem myself uh, small and insignificant, lowly minded, uh, it's how I look at myself. Humility is how I evaluate myself. It's not how you evaluate me, it's how I value, evaluate myself. And so tied to meekness, you'll see in verses, studying the word meekness on a topical study, you'll see the word humble, humility, and, and those words often interchangeably are used in, in relation to uh, those same verses. And so that's what it means to be lowly minded, have an accurate assessment of ourselves poor in spirit, not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. And so it's having a biblical view of myself. So it's not, oh, I'm no good and, and uh, uh, you deserve better than me. And it's not pride on the flip side. 
Because sometimes we can be so proudly humble uh, because of woe was me and I'm just such a bad person. And yeah, we're, we're that way, but that's between us and God, not between us and others. And uh, sometimes we try to over humble ourselves and in so doing we end up uh, focusing on pride just as much as if we we were on the other uh, spectrum. The second word that we look at is the word meekness. And so we've got humility. That's how I view myself. Meekness is an attitude towards the dealings of God and others as they affect me. And so my meekness is how I respond, my attitude concerning how God treats me or maybe how I think God should treat me. And, uh, or how others treat me, or maybe how I think that others should treat me. Uh, and so it's an attitude toward God and His dealings with us, and our attitudes of others in their dealings with us. It's an inward heart attitude. So humility is how I view myself. Uh, meekness is how I, allow, how I respond to how God interacts with me. It's how I respond with how others interact with me. Then there's the third word, and that's the word gentleness. Gentleness often is confused as the word meekness. And again, a lot of these overlap. In some areas they do overlap. But the word gentleness and meekness often is used in the same verse or a couple of verses together. So we know they don't mean the exact same thing. So humility is how I view myself. Meekness is the attitude that I have towards God's dealings with me and towards others dealers with me and gentleness listen now this is important has to do with my treatment of others gentleness has to do with my treatment of others and so meekness is an attitude uh, of heart about others gentleness is the outward action of how we treat those people in response to the meekness or lack of meekness that we have so if i'm meek how i respond to god dealings with my life, how I respond to others' interactions and dealings with my life will determine how meek of a person I am. Do I have to give them a piece of my mind? Do I have to show them up? Do I have to do something like that? So my response to God and others is meekness. But it goes beyond that. Gentleness uh, is then the outworkings or the external out, outline of fruit, if you would, of how I treat others. Gentleness is the expression and outward action of the attitude of the inward meekness. And so for someone to say that I have a spirit of meekness, a heart of meekness concerning how God has treated me and how others have treated me. And when we talk about how others and God treat us, when we're talking about meekness, we're probably not talking about God treating us the way we think he should treat us and others not treating us the way we think they should treat us because the very, ne the very need for meekness sort of gives us the, uh, the, uh, uh, the assumption that Something that God did, we didn't think was right. Something that God allowed, we didn't think was fair. Something that others did, we didn't think. So, meekness is tied to some injustice, some unfairness, uh, some um, hurt, disappointment. We can fill whatever may not be using the right words tonight, but you can sort of see where the, the, the direction we're going is a result of that. Now, gentleness is the outward action of the true condition of a meek heart. If I'm not showing the outward actions of gentleness with others uh, concerning those who have treated me unjustly, then am I really allowing the, the, that fruit or that uh, meekness to be able to grow uh, in my life? And so uh, the person who's lacking meekness passes judgment quickly on others, jumps to conclusions very quickly, and is quick to write others off. Well, if that's the way they're going to do it, I don't have anything to do with them at all. And, and so that's not a meek person. A meek person does not come to a quick uh, judgment, doesn't come to a, uh, you know, a quick uh, a judgment of someone in, the, in a relation to that. A person who curbs their tongue uh, is a meek person. A person who considers before passing judgment, speaking ill of someone, is a meek person. He thinks before he speaks. Uh, he doesn't just blurt out some negative, critical things about something that comes out of his mind. He learns to first control his mind and, uh, and then be able to control his mouth. And so my humility is how I view myself. How do you view yourself? Uh, and uh, then God says your meekness is how you respond to those things that you did not like that God brought into your life or allowed into your life and that others brought into your life or that you know, were instrumental that, that came to your life. And so your meekness will be shown, the maturity of your meekness. And my meekness is when injustices and hurts are brought my way. 
uh, and how do I deal with those? And then the true condition of the heart of meekness will show forth itself on how much outward actions, outward display of uh, gentleness that I'll give to those that have been hurtful to me and unjust to me. And, and so I'll show, that'll be the outworkings of that, which is what gentleness is. And so uh, we see then that, uh, so let me give you a couple of verses here. Go to, go to Psalm and uh, chapter uh, 25, Psalm 25 and uh, verse, verse number 9. Psalm 25 and verse number 9. When we talked about a moment ago where it talked about uh, taming a wild animal, um, the, 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 that thought of meekness, taming a wild animal, uh, deals with a little phrase called accustomed to the hand. Accustomed to the hand. Now that's a phrase that would be used of, of ranchers or those that uh, have to, to break a, a, a cow or an auction or a donkey or a horse. Uh, so they could then be used for something you know, productive on, on the ranch or on the farm. And so it would be accustomed to the hand. Uh, that word meekness comes from two words uh, that mean accustomed to the hand. And in the Latin, so we can see that direction where it goes. And so it refers to the taming of a wild animal, breaking of a horse, breaking of a stallion until it's, it's meek. And it becomes accustomed to the hand or it becomes responsive to the hand of its owner or the rider. And so a good, uh, we've got a fellow over here and he's always riding his horse. And uh, teaching that horse to become accustomed to the hand. So just uh, with the, the, the slight tug on, on the reins or uh, just maybe a, a slight uh, tug on, on the mane of the, of the, 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 the horse hair or maybe a, a little jab in the, in the side of his foot. Uh, that horse becomes one with that rider and he becomes accustomed to the hand. He's a, sort of like a, your dog or a, a pet. Uh, you'll know sometimes uh, if you've not dealt rightly with your pet, when you go to pet him, do they, do they arch and duck and, and, and assume that you're going to slap them upside the head? And, uh, and so you've not trained them to be accustomed to the hand, right? And so uh, that's why they teach you uh, when you discipline animals, you get a, get a newspaper, get something other than your hand because your hand is supposed to be what? That which reaches out in love and support and gentleness and, and uh, uh, provision, feeding them and things. And so, but oftentimes we'll see pets, and you go to the pound and, and you'll see a lot of gun shy animals because they're not, a, they've never been trained to be accustomed to the hand, uh, to where they, they feel a confidence and a trust in that hand that reaches out uh, for them. Uh, accustomed to the hand uh, then means that pliable, responsive, submissive responsiveness of godly leadership in our life. And so God says, I want you to be accustomed to the hand. And I preached on the issue about the hand of God several weeks ago. But God said, when my hand reaches out, I, I want you to be sensitive to the touch of God's hand. God doesn't want to have to whap us upside the head. God wants us to be sensitive, accustomed to the hand of God. So when God begins to guide us and instruct us and teach us, that our natural response is not to duck and say, God's out to hurt me or God's out to you know, do bad to me. Our natural response is we see the loving hand of God. We become accustomed to the hand of God, meekness, how we respond. To the hand of God, even when we could assume that the hand of God has brought hurt and harm and pain and suffering to our lives, but we don't jerk because a meek spirit is one that is used to the hand of God, knowing that they can trust the hand of God. And so uh, that accustomed the hand is where God puts his hand on my spirit, and I say, yes, Lord. And there's a calmness that comes over the turbulence and troubleness of my soul by the touch of of the accustomed of the hand, and that meekness is then that byproduct of being sensitive to the touch of God. And I want to be sensitive to the hand of God's touch and responsive to it. That's a very important aspect of meekness. I want to be sensitive to His touch. I want to be guided by His touch. I want to be comforted by His touch. And that meekness allows all of that to take place. Uh, in regards to the accustomed there. Okay, now you got the verse here in Psalm uh, 25. Look in Psalm 25 and uh, verse 
verse number nine. So we see humility, how I view myself. Meekness is my attitude uh, towards the dealings of God and others as they affect me. So that's my attitude, my spirit. And uh, gentleness then is how, uh, what do I do with the treatment of others that have done, that I felt have done me wrong and that have been unkind and unjust to me. Gentleness then is the outworkings of the maturity of meekness in my heart. And, and so, look in Psalm 25, verse 9. It says, The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. Now, take that thought a moment ago that we saw, accustomed to the hand. Now, the accustomed to the hand is tied to a, a horse or some animal, wild animal that needs taming. And, and so, that accustomed to the hand then becomes a, a, a hand of, of love and, and comfort and strength and guidance and direction. And so, God says then, uh, the meek... Will he guide in judgment? So that would tell us, if I'm not meek, I'm not going to probably be able to be guided in judgment. And then he says, and the meek will he teach his way. And so the opposite of that, if I'm not meek, then I'm probably not going to be able to be taught the ways of God. So if we, if according to this verse, if we want God to guide us, if we want God to teach us the way we should go, if we want to know what good judgment is, if we want to have insight and wisdom, if we want to have understanding, then God said it would be better, very beneficial for you to be meek. Because I cannot guide you if you're not meek. If you're not accustomed to the hand, if you don't have trust in the, in the master's hand in your life, and uh, I can't teach you, I can't guide you, I can't instruct you, and I can't give you what you desire uh, with that. And so meek people then, according to this verse, are humble people. We already saw that. A meek person is a teachable person, and a meek person is one then that would be open uh, to instruction and guidance and direction. So the person that thinks they have it all together and knows everything is not going to come to God asking for wisdom. They're not going to come to God asking for help. Why? They've got it figured out. And that's why it's so difficult to reach those in this world with the gospel that think their life is going good. And uh, they got their bills paid, they're living in nice homes, uh, they got the RVs and the boats and this and that and everything else. And so from their perspective, life is good. I don't need help. I don't need the crutch of a religion. I don't need crutch of a Christianity. And I'm great. And, uh, and until we come to a place of a meekness, then we're not able, as the Bible says here, to be guided in judgment, God's judgment, or to be taught uh, the way of God. And so God says that the person who humbly recognizes their need for direction will find direction. James 1, 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God and give it to all men liberally, and it breaketh not, and it shall be given him. And so I think sometimes when we don't know which way to go, uh, God doesn't tell us which way to go because we've not convinced God that we have a meek heart, a meek spirit. God's not going to tell us what to do so it's another option that we can add to our list. God's going to tell us what to do because he knows there's a meek spirit that wants to respond to the accustomed to the hand that's on their life. And so uh, I think sometimes we don't know which way to go. We don't know what to do. We don't know how to handle the situation. And we say, Lord, you haven't shown me what to do. It may be because God knows that we don't have a meek spirit and we don't have a teachable spirit. We're not willing to receive what it is that God would show us if God even showed it to us. And so God doesn't want to show us something so we can decide if we want to do it. God wants to show us something uh, so that we have a meek spirit, a pliable, receptive heart that says, I need help as a parent. I need help as a husband. I need help as a wife. I need help as, as a, 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 try, a family man trying to help me with my finances. I need help, God. And I can't do Listen, you start off with poor in spirit, realize you got nothing. And that begins to break, break your heart. And uh, you mourn. And then that leads you to a place where God is so good to you in spite of how wicked you are. And uh, in spite of how you feel, and God says, I want you to be blessed. And it humbles you to realize that God, in his goodness and love, would be so kind when you've had a pretty good expression of who you are. God's revealed some things about you that you didn't like seeing, but God's now beginning to reveal some things to you through meekness uh, that he's uh, good to you in spite of you. So it's not, I'm owed this or I'm deserving of this. It's, I don't understand why God does this. 
It's beyond me why God would be so kind in this area. Uh, take your Bibles and go to uh, James chapter uh, 1, if you would. I mentioned a moment ago here in James chapter 1, verse 5, uh, if any of you like wisdom. Now, wisdom, there's earthly wisdom and there's heavenly or, or wisdom from above. Uh, what we want is wor- uh, uh, wisdom from above, uh, heavenly wisdom. And so what's wisdom? It's having the mind of God to do what God would do in any given situation. Uh, we use that little phrase uh, they used it in a while back, uh, what would Jesus do? And that's a neat little slogan to use, but the problem is most people have no idea uh, what Jesus would do. They think this is what he would do. They think this is what he should do, but they have no idea. Wisdom is having the mind of God, which is what? The Bible. And allowing the Bible then uh, to be our roadmap, our guide, and surrendering, submitting, yielding ourselves to the things of God. So uh, if, if you're here tonight and you're saying, you know, I just don't know, God, God doesn't seem to be showing me what to do in this situation or how to handle this situation or which way to go in my life, and uh, God's just not showing me. Uh, well, God will show you if he knows that you're meek and uh, he can show you what? The meek will he guide. The meek will he teach. But if you're not guidable, if you're not teachable, he's not going to guide you. You're on your own. He's not going to teach you. You're on your own. And so God says this meekness is so important, but it doesn't just happen. It starts point one, point two, and boom, now point three as a result of meekness. Look, so John, James 1, 5. If any of you lack wisdom, who's that? That's all of us. Man, I need help. I need divine insight in this situation, in this relationship, in this trial, in this hardship, in this crossroad in my life, in this decision I'm about to make. I need wisdom. God says what? Let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally. What's that mean? God doesn't ration out wisdom. God says, man, I'll just overflow you with wisdom if... I'm convinced you're not just looking for uh, one of many options to do, but you're wanting help. You're wanting direction. God I can give you a solution, but you may not like the solution I give you. But if you're wanting wisdom and you ask of God for wisdom, then God says, I want you to know that you're, I want to know that you're going to do what I'm going to give you. And then he says, I braid it not, and it shall be given to him. Now skip down to chapter 1, same chapter, and look down at verse number 21. The same thought here as we're looking at uh, uh, Psalm 25, 9. The meek will he guide in judgment, the meek will he teach his way. James 1, 21 says, Wherefore, lay aside all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. Notice now we see that word meekness, and it's tied to what? Receiving with meekness, the engrafted word. And so the word of God is able to cleanse us. It's able to renew us. It's able to transform our lives. It's able to save us as a lost person. But if we don't receive it, it doesn't do us any good. Uh, and so just to know it's there and what it can do doesn't benefit my life at all. I've got to receive what God says. I've got to have that spirit of meekness. And God says receive with what? Meekness. What's meekness? That's uh, the hand of God where we have uh, under the control of God, accustomed to the hand. And God guides us and God directs us. And we're teachable. We're pliable. We're sensitive to the things of God. We're not resisting God. We're in a spirit of receiving with what? Meekness. Uh, that word of God, that engrafted word of God. And, and so uh, we see then that God says if you don't receive it and you resist what God says, then we don't have what? We don't have a humble spirit. We don't have a teachable spirit. We don't have a spirit that's open to counsel. And so God says no matter how much the Bible can have an impact on your life, if you just are picking and choosing what you want to do and you're not receiving with what? Meekness. That's an attitude saying, boy, I'll tell you what, I am wicked I grieve because of my wickedness, and I don't know why God is so good to me. I don't know why God thinks so highly of me. And uh, it it humbles you to a place to say, wow, whatever God says, I'm ready to receive it. And uh, where of over here, if you don't think you're poor in spirit, I don't need that stuff. I don't need that stuff. I don't need to apply that to my life. Why? Because you're not poor in spirit. You're, you think you're better than you are. You think you're more spiritual than you are. You think you're more righteous than you are. And uh, there is none righteous, no, not one. The best of our righteousness, the Bible says, are as filthy rags. And that's not just before you got saved. That's even after you got saved. Only righteousness we have that is worthy in sight of God is what? Clothed in His righteousness. That's what allows you to be accepted in the beloved, forgiven of those sins. And so God says, I want, you, I want to guide you. I want to teach you. But I I cannot guide you. I cannot teach you. If you've not convinced me, you have a meek spirit. And a meek spirit uh, is uh, crucial to receiving with meekness 
the engrafted Word of God uh, into your life. I like that word engrafted. Of course, it's an orchard term. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, and we don't have a lot of that here, but in the San Joaquin Valley, there's a lot of orchards. And oftentimes, they would uh, take different branches from one fruit tree, and they would graft it. Some of the old timers, and they were good at it. I don't know, they'd put some tar or whatever they would do, and they'd graft a branch onto uh, you know, an apple tree, and they'd put uh, you know, a plum, tree, plum branch or something on that apple tree, graft it in. And uh, over a period of time, that branch would be grafted in, and so it would begin to bear the fruit of the, the plum there, and the apples or whatever branches were a part of that. And so God says, I want the Word of God to be grafted into your life. In graft, what's it mean? I want to become a part of your life. I want it to become not just something you do on Sunday, not just something that's a, that's a, a, a token of your life. I want it to become an all-consuming part, tied and abide in me, and I and you as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself. I want it to be grafted in uh, to the Word of God, and uh, which is able to save your souls, it goes on to say. And so maybe we haven't willfully said, I won't do that, but we're just passing over some things. We neglect some truths. We don't receive them. And sometimes we see something or hear something preached from God's word and think, well, there's no way I'm going to do that. That's too hard. I don't want to do that. And if we resist the word of God, uh, we see that it doesn't change us. Our lives are not changed for the good. We'll be changed, but it won't be good for the good. And uh, God says, I want to change your life. I want you to be different and uh, transform. Uh, how do we do that? We've got to have meekness. Meekness becomes such an important part of, uh, of our lives. And so receive with meekness the engrafted Word of God. And so to have a meek response to the Word of God is to receive God's Word with meekness, meaning you've got a listening ear with the intent to apply what you're hearing. I uh, like uh, the story of 1 Samuel chapter 3, uh, where Eli the priest spoke to the young man uh, Samuel. And uh, he says, if he calls thee again, what's he say to say? Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. And uh, that's what, uh, in grafting that word with a meek spirit, uh, is, Lord, I'm reading my Bible to hear. I'm coming to church to hear. And I want to hear the word of God. And uh, so to receive the word with meekness means not only to have a listening heart, uh, but also has, has a, a thought of a, a humble and a teachable spirit. Psalm 25, 4, uh, the Bible says that, uh, and, uh, show me thy ways, O Lord, teach me. Thy paths in the same chapter, verse 9, where it says the meek will he guide. And say, I want to know the way of God. And I want to know the, 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 the path to take. And I want to know what's to do, verse 5. And God says in verse number 9, I'll show you the way. I'll guide you down the path. I'll teach you. But you've got to convince God that you have a meek heart. You have a meek heart. Meekness is not weakness. But I think meekness is a weakness in a lot of our lives. I think it's an area of of weakness that we have in our lives. And so we receive the word of God. And uh, to receive the word of God with meekness means we bow the knee and we say, yes, your majesty. Yes, your honor. Let me give you a verse. It's, it's a little different verse, but go to Ezekiel if you would. And it ties with this thing of, of, of receiving the word of God with meekness. You know, not everything. Now, when we're talking about meekness, uh, Ezekiel. Uh, Ezekiel, look in Ezekiel chapter 24. Now remember when we're talking about uh, meekness, we're talking about something that rubs us the wrong way. It's not, you don't need to be meek to, some, to get your, your way. Well, where's the quality of meekness if everything's going the way you want to go? Everybody's treating you fairly and kindly and justly. Where's, where's the need for meekness? So meekness implies... It gives the assumption that there's some injustices, there's some hurt, there's some tug of war in your soul that's taking place. So when God talks about uh, being uh, with meekness, receiving the engrafted word of God, what's he saying? He's not talking about the verses you agree with. He's talking about those verses you have a hard time digesting. Those that apply to your particular situation, your situation right now, that crossroad. And God says the degree of receiving the word of God with meekness and grafting into your soul and grafting into your life is based upon those passages of scripture that go contrary to the way we're living or the way we're wanting to live. Now with that thought, let's transition. Let me show you here in Ezekiel chapter 24. It's an, it's an interesting passage. It really is. Uh, and I think it illustrates very powerfully uh, the response of meekness uh, and obedience to the Word of God, this thing of being engrafted in the Word of God. Ezekiel 24, look in verse 
15. We're going to look at several verses as this builds here tonight. We'll be done. Ezekiel 24, verse 15, the Bible says, Also the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, behold, I take away from thee the desire of thine eyes with a stroke. Yet neither shalt thou mourn nor weep, neither shall thy tears run down. Now here's what God's telling Ezekiel. He's saying, I'm about to take from you the most precious thing that you have. I'm about ready to take that from you. But as an object lesson of the people of Israel, God goes on to tell him through his word, I don't want you to show any outward evidence of grieving or mourning. So I'm about ready to take something very dear to your heart. The word of the Lord came unto me. So the word came. And he says, Son of man, behold, I take away from thee the desire of thine eyes with a stroke. So sort of just like in a moment of time, that one phone call or that one whatever, in a moment of time, God says that very desire, the, the apple of your eye, the most dearest thing to your life, God says, I'm going to take it away from you. And then God goes on to say, but I don't want you to show any evidence of grieving or mourning when that is taken away from you. Let's skip down. Go to verse number 17. He says, God tells him, he says, forbear to cry. Make no mourning for the dead. Bind the tire of thine head upon thee. And put on thy shoes upon thy feet. And cover not thy lips. And eat not the bread of men. In other words, he says, sigh in your heart, but not aloud. You can do it on the inside of your heart, but I don't want you to express it. I don't want anyone to see on the outside, the hurt, the grief, the sorrow, the sadness that you're going through. This is the word of the Lord now. This is the word of the Lord that came to Ezekiel and said, Son of man. He's talking about the don't do the things that you would do to show cultural expressions of wailing or grieving or mourning. He says, I don't want you to show any outward signs of, of that. He says, forbear to cry. I don't want you to cry. I want you to express any outward grief at all. Stay with me now. So look what Ezekiel says in verse number 18. Ezekiel says here, he says, So I spoke unto the people in the morning. 24 hours hadn't even passed yet. And at even my wife died. And I did in the morning as I was commanded. Receive with meekness. The engrafted word of God. It's easy to do what you want to do and that you feel you have the power and ability to do, but here was a request that was given by God. I'm going to take your wife, the dearest, closest, apple of your eye, the desire of your life. And he says, I don't want you to show any outward grief. I don't want you to show any outward mourning. I don't want you to show any type of any outward sign that what takes place in your heart of how you're feeling is shown on the outside. And Ezekiel says, my wife died and I did in the morning as I was commanded. Here's a whole lesson for Israel in this. And God was doing something that was very unusual. The point is this. God gave Ezekiel instructions in the toughest possible area of his life. God says, you're going to lose the thing that's the most precious to you. And when you do, I don't want you to show any outward grief in the loss of that. Ezekiel said, at even, my wife died. And I did in the morning as I was commanded. This is, folks, receiving the word of God with meekness. is saying, yes, Lord, whatever you say, yes, Lord. That's receiving the word of God with meekness. There's some tough things that God tells us to do in the Word of God. There's some really hard things, and we can't do it in our own power, our own strength. We must tap into God. And so God will often tell us things in His Word that you're saying, wow, how in the world am I supposed to do that? You're to receive it if you have a meek heart. You'll receive the Word of God. And you'll then begin to outwardly do what I asked you to do in this case, not to show any grief on the outside. It's a hard attitude that we read about in Psalm 119, 60, where it says, I made haste 
and delay not to keep thy commandments. Delay is disobedience. Um, you know, disgruntledness is disobedience, bad attitude. And so David said, I made haste. I delay not to keep the commandment of God. Listen, when God says something, we have a spirit of meekness, ready to receive the engrafted word of God in meekness. You don't justify and debate and figure out if you're going to obey it or not. You quickly, immediately, in haste, you make sure you do the right thing. It says, yes, Lord, if that's what you want me to do, I'll do that. How can people that uh, we've read about and we've seen where horrible crimes have been committed, horrible, horrible, ruthless crimes have been committed, and you'll see the, uh, the, the parents or the family of those loved ones that have been so brutally um, dealt with, and you'll see a forgiveness that is given by those parents where maybe a child was taken in death or some wicked thing was, was done. And they in their heart say, we're not angry. We forgive them. We forgive that person. That's receiving the word of God in meekness. Because there's no way you're going to do the hard things that God tells you to do if you don't have a heart of meekness. And meekness will not come until point three. Because you've got to first see yourself intellectually as terrible, wicked, vile, sinful, and God begins to reveal to us, blessed are they that are poor in spirit, how really vile that we are. And then that information, that intellect, transitions down to our hearts. And now blessed are they that mourn. You now begin to feel a hurt and a pain and a sadness because of the hurt that you grieve God, the reproach you've caused the Savior, your testimony, or those, uh, you know, church family or whatever it might be. And then so, so you, you, you know how bad you are. You now feel bad for how bad you are. And then God then begins to do kindness to you and is good to you and is gracious to you and blesses you. And God begins to produce in your heart meekness. Why would God be so kind to me when you feel so bad about what you're intellectually aware of? And now you're very humbled you're not expecting God's goodness. You're amazed and in awe of God's goodness. You're not demanding God do this for me. No, you are so humbled. Why in the world would God ever even do that goodness to me? And so you see this transition that's taking place. And folks, this is a recipe, God's recipe to happiness. Because when you follow this order of these steps or these ingredients, you then begin to see each step begins to produce a happiness that the world can never provide in your life. Meekness says, I know that God has his reasons and it doesn't matter if I can see those reasons or not. The meek person will not fight against God or struggle or contend with God. Meekness is that temper of spirit in which you accept God's dealings with us as good, without resisting, without disputing, and without complaining. You see it as good. Because remember what I said, humility is how you view yourself. Meekness is how you deal your attitude towards that which is done towards you from God or from others. And then meekness is the realization and recognition of how God thinks so highly of you and God loves you so much and God is so good to you. It's like, I don't understand it. Because at your most broken position, God draws himself nearer than ever before and draws you unto himself and says, I love you. And now you're in a position where my love can truly be extended to you beyond before because as long because you thought you're deserving of it you're worthy of it and God where are you and God why this and why that but when the poor in spirit the morning you're now just so grateful for every little thing that God does in your life Ezekiel said at even my wife died and I did in the morning as I was commanded God said here's what I tell you to do according to my word thus saith the Lord. And he followed through because he had a heart of meekness. And the engrafted word of God wasn't just, if it's convenient, I'll do it. 
If it's something I want to do, I'll do it. It's the word of God. And if God said it, I need to have a heart of meekness and allow that word to be applied to my life. And you receive it. You receive it. Father, tonight, help us to see how much you love us. It's interesting, and we've not gone through all the things about meekness. There's several other things that we can look at here the next time. But, but Lord, I do pray that you would help us to see some insights into your word tonight to realize that meekness is to be accustomed to the hand. I don't want to flinch when the hand of God reaches out because you've convinced me you love me. You've convinced me that you always do all things well. You've convinced me that you will work all things together for good. And so when the hand of God reaches out, we don't want to flinch. We want to see it as a loving hand, a comforting hand, a provision providing hand, a directing, guiding hand. And Father, that our heart and meekness would be teachable, pliable, sensitive to what you're trying to do in our lives. And you tell us some hard things to do in your word, hard things. But if I have a spirit of meekness, then I can be guided and I can be instructed. But if I'm confused, not seeking or not, not sensing your guidance and instruction in my life, it's because you're not going to guide those that don't have a meek heart that want to follow the guide. The, 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 the verse says, follow on, our theme for this year. But it's a choice we've got to make. He can't force you to follow him, but it is an invitation of continuation to journey on forward more with your Savior. God said, I've got so much I want to help you with and guide you and direct you and teach you and instruct you. But I won't be able to do that if you don't have a meek heart. If you're not receiving the meekness, receiving the word of God with meekness, it's not going to be beneficial to you. You have to come to the place where you're meek, but it's point three ingredient of the recipe. I can't jump to point three if I don't see the poorness of spirit. Holy Spirit of God, reveal to us, reveal to me, reveal to us individually how wicked we are. And intellectually bring it to our attention how vile and sinful we are. And then, Father, transition that information to how we feel and the hurt and the sadness and sorrow we have with the mourning. And then in the midst of that, mournfulness that we have and sorrow then you're so good to us you're so kind to us and it begins to reveal a meekness in our heart and it begins to grow father we're weak in our meekness though meekness is not weakness bless this invitation tonight in jesus name